Hey there everyone, for those of you that don't know me, my name is David and my wife and I live in our RV as full-time RVers and we travel the country and explore everything that America has to offer. However, sometimes we do come back to our hometown and when we do, we stay with my parents here. The only outlet that they have available for us to hook our travel trailer up to, however, is only 15 amp service when our travel trailer requires 30 amp service. And not only that, but the outlet is nowhere near where we park our travel trailer next to their house at. So we have to run a fairly long extension cable to their to the back of their house and into their patio where we can then plug into a 15 amp outlet. We unfortunately end up tripping breakers fairly often because you know it gets pretty hot here in Indiana during the spring and the summer so we're trying to run our air conditioning and you know the plug that we hook up into also uh, is on the same breaker as various parts of the inside of their house. So we only have 15 amps available to run our trailer's air conditioner as well as various electronics throughout their house. So today, my old man and I are gonna take on a project to install a 30 amp, 120 volt RV outlet on the side of their house right next to where we park our travel trailer out and it's going to solve all of our issues with not having enough current available to run our hydro appliances in our travel trailer like our air conditioning so that we no longer trip any breakers when we try to run them and power our travel trailer. Before we get started though I need to make the disclaimer that I am not an electrician and neither is my dad. This is just a video showing you how we tackled this project on his home. So before you start it yourself you need to consult an actual electrician. But let's get started. Like I said before, we're going to be installing this 30 amp RV receptacle on the exterior wall right next to where we park our travel trailer. So it's really close by and we don't have to run any more extension cables. And we'll probably be mounting the box somewhere in this area at least 24 inches off the ground. This spot is extremely convenient to mount a new receptacle because as we walk on into the garage and check the opposite side of that wall, you'll see that the electrical box is right there. So we won't have to make any complex wire runs. We'll just drop a wire straight down from the electrical panel right to the receptacle. The only parts we had to purchase for this project was a 30 amp 120 volt RV power outlet box, six feet of 10-2 Romex wire, a 30 amp single pull breaker, and some vinyl J channel to trim around the electrical box. 10-2 Romex has three wires, one with a black insulator for the line, one with a white insulator for neutral, and a bare copper wire that is the grounding wire. 10-2 Romex is suitable for 30 amp receptacles that have a wire run shorter than 25 feet. If your wire run is going to be longer than 25 feet, 8-2 Romex is recommended. 30 amp service RVs require 120 volts, not 240. So be sure that the circuit breaker you buy is a single pole 30 amp breaker, not double pole. And if you plan on doing this project for yourself, there's a link in the video description below to a 30 amp RV power outlet box. The first thing you're going to want to do before getting started is look at your home's electrical panel and make sure that you have open spots for a new breaker. What made this install even easier for us is that there is this old phone wire enclosure directly below the electrical panel and we tested these wires and found them all to be de-energized and unused. So we're going to run the new wire for the receptacle straight down from the electrical panel into this enclosure and then out through the exterior wall. And then it was time to remove the vinyl siding from the area that we're going to be mounting the RV electrical box. Next, we measured to locate a stud as well as a horizontal board that is supporting that telephone enclosure. We will be screwing into these two boards to mount the RV electrical box. We then removed more vinyl siding to get it completely out of our way so that we could properly mount the new receptacle box. And if you don't have a siding removal tool, I highly suggest that you pick one up. Otherwise, this part is going to be a big pain for you. And I'll go ahead and drop a link in the video description below to a siding removal tool. Unfortunately, the electrical box that we used only has knockouts at the bottom and a hole at the top, but we need the wire to run through the wall and directly into the back of the electrical box just for a cleaner install. So to fix that, we used a hole saw and drilled a hole into the back of the receptacle box. We then temporarily mounted the receptacle box to the wall and made sure that it was level with a bubble level. We then marked on the wall the location of the hole that we just drilled in the back of the receptacle box. And then we drilled that hole through the wall too. 
Whenever we do a project, we want to make sure that the components we use are going to last. So we then removed the receptacle box from the wall and using a primer spray paint, we coated the bare metal on the hole that we just drilled just to make sure that it doesn't rust out over time. And while that primer was drying, we cut out some flashing that is going to go behind that receptacle box and drill the hole in it that the wire is going to run through. We then placed this bushing through the hole that we drilled into the receptacle box. Next, we placed caulk over the screw holes as well as around the perimeter of the bushing on the back of the receptacle box just so water can't intrude this way. Then, while the caulk was still wet, we mounted the receptacle box to the wall, being sure to hit the studs that we measured earlier so that it was mounted securely. We then trimmed around the bottom of the receptacle box with J-channel by cutting it like this so that the side pieces of J-channel can be bent in under this piece of J-channel so that water can't get in. And then we mounted it to the wall using siding nails. We then measured and cut the side pieces of J-channel. However, these ones are made slightly differently than the bottom piece. Using a speed square, we measured off one straight end and one 45 degree end for the side pieces of J-channel so that it can snap into the bottom and top pieces and also look aesthetically pleasing. Also, after that 45 degree cut, the rest of the J-channel is sliced and then bent down so that it can bend up under the bottom section of J channel. We then nailed this piece of J channel to the wall as well and made a mirror image of it to trim the other side of the receptacle box. All that was left for the trim then was the top piece. It's very similar to the side pieces, however both ends are cut at 45 degree angles and both ends are bent down to fold over the side pieces of J channel. We nailed this to the wall as well and then trimming around the receptacle box was finished. This part of the job wasn't really necessary because I suppose we could have just ran screws straight through the receptacle box, through the vinyl siding, and into the wall to mount it. However, this just looks so much nicer and ensures that it is weatherproof. And once that trim was finished, we just had to cut out some sections of the existing vinyl siding to make room for that receptacle box. All that was left before we actually got into wiring the receptacle was to replace the vinyl siding. Here's how it looks when you use the J-channel trim the way we did. I think it looks pretty sweet and the extra time it took to do this was well worth it in my opinion. Now we can begin wiring in the receptacle, but before we do anything, you'll want to shut off the main breaker which will kill power to your entire house as well as your entire electrical panel except the main cables that run into the electrical panel. These are still energized, so be very careful when working near them. Here's the electrical panel we're working with. This house was built in the 1960s, and since then there have been a lot of changes to its electrical system, so unfortunately the electrical panel is not very well organized. This panel has five open slots, and we'll be utilizing one of them with our 30 amp single pole breaker to supply power to our new receptacle. One thing to note about this electrical panel that's probably different from yours if you have a newer house is that the neutral and grounding buses are one in the same. On your electrical panel though, they're probably separate buses. On the main electrical panel, this serves the same purpose. However, since the 1960s, wiring standards have changed. Power may be cut to the house, but thankfully our RV has an inverter which will supply 120 volt AC electricity to two outside receptacles. We'll be using that to power our work light as well as a 90 degree drill that we use to drill a hole through that telephone enclosure. And then using a hammer and a punch, we knocked out one of the bottom knockouts on the electrical panel. We then ran 10-2 Romex through that knockout down into that telephone enclosure and then straight out to the new receptacle box. Next, I stripped back the outer sheath on the Romex cable, snapped the new 30 amp single pole breaker into an open slot, bent the black line wire right into position in front of that new breaker, cut the wire to the proper length and then stripped it back, fed the wire into the breaker and then tightened it down. Then I moved on to the neutral wire. I bent the white neutral wire into place just in front of an open slot in the neutral and grounding bus, cut it to length, stripped it back, and then placed it into the open port and tightened down the screw. And then I moved on to the bare grounding wire, which the procedure for this is the exact same as the white neutral wire. I bent it into place in front of another open port in the neutral and grounding bus, cut it to length, and then placed it into the open port and tightened the screw down. It's important to note that in your neutral and grounding buses, you never want to double up wire. Each individual wire should have its own port and screw in these buses. 
We're now finished inside of the electrical panel, so we can put the door back on. We're now ready to wire in the receptacle, so I strip back the outer sheathing on the Romex cable, strip back the black line wire as well as the white neutral wire. Here's the wiring diagram that came with this receptacle box. It shows that the black line wire gets wired into the left port, the white neutral wire gets wired into the right port, and the bare grounding wire gets attached to a case grounding bus, which comes already attached to the receptacle box. A green grounding wire is already attached to the other side of this bus, as well as the grounding port on the receptacle. So I place the black line wire into the left port, the white neutral wire into the right port, and the bare grounding wire into that case ground bus. I ensured that the wire screws were all tight and then replaced the receptacle into the box. I then replaced the screw that mounts the receptacle to the receptacle box. And now all that's left is to test the receptacle. So we can go back to the electrical panel and flip on the 30 amp single pull breaker that we just installed. And now we're ready to flip on the main breaker as well. It's usually a good idea to double check everything just to make sure you're not gonna have any problems when you re-energize your entire electrical panel. Now before we just go and plug our RV into this new receptacle, we're going to want to test it with a multimeter to make sure our voltage is correct. With the multimeter set to read out volts AC and the positive probe placed in the line port and the negative probe placed in the neutral port, you should see a voltage readout around 120 volts. Now with the positive probe placed in the line port and the negative probe placed in the grounding port, we should still see about 120 volts. And then with the positive probe placed in the neutral port and the negative probe placed in the grounding port, you should see a voltage readout of zero volts. Now before plugging the RV into the receptacle, we're gonna do one last sanity check. And that is plugging in our RV surge protector into the receptacle. This RV surge protector has LED readouts that will let you know if there are any issues with the receptacle you're plugging it into, such as open neutral, open ground, reverse polarity, or no power. Now the test that we just did with the multimeter would tell us if there were any of these issues, but like I said, this is just an extra sanity check. On a side note, it's always a good idea to use an RV surge protector when you're plugging in your RV to any receptacle. It only takes one large surge to burn up your entire RV electrical system. If you don't have one, I'll go ahead and drop a link in the video description below to this one we have. We love it. Now we can plug the RV in and see if everything works. Here's the fridge working off of AC power as well as our air conditioner. Success! Then we tidied up by replacing the cover on the telephone wire enclosure and created a much cleaner and more obvious identification system as to what circuit breaker provides power to what part of the house. And then the final step of this project was to crack open a couple cold ones and celebrate a job well done. And that's it, the project is finished. We will now never have to worry about tripping breakers with our travel trailer when we are firing up our hydro appliances like our air conditioner and our water heater when we are visiting my parents here. And that's great because we felt bad every time we would trip a breaker because it would knock out the electrical service to about a fourth of their house. But now we don't have to worry about that. And it's a bonus for my parents too because up until this point, they did not have an electrical outlet here on this side of their house. And now with a simple 30 amp to 20 amp or 15 amp adapter, they now have electrical service available for whatever purpose they may need it for. The total cost of this project was only about $60 and you can knock it out in about an afternoon. Hopefully this video is helpful if you're looking to take on a project like this for yourself. But that's all for this video. I'll catch you guys later. Bye.